Hey everyone, it's Ray, the Singing Talit, uh, continuing the reading of Understanding the Difficult Words of Jesus by David Bibbon and Roy Blizzard Jr. Uh, this book was suggested by Nehemia Gordon uh, in a presentation he did, so I decided I'd pick it up. Uh, it's on the idea of the supremacy of Hebrew text which is to say that the Hebrew text would be the uh, primary uh, work from which the Gospels was taken and not a Greek source or an Aramaic source. And that's based mostly on the findings from the Dead Sea Scrolls or the findings of the Qumran Caves. Chapter 5, Extra Biblical Evidence for Hebrew. An impressive amount of extra biblical evidence points to the use of Hebrew in first century Israel. The testimony of the church fathers, the Dead Scrolls, Dead Sea Scrolls, coins of the time, and inscriptions from the first century B.C. and A.D., the writings of Josephus, and rabbinical literature. In this chapter, we will examine some of that evidence. <clears throat> the Church Fathers. The early Church Fathers are usually referred to as the Anti-Nicene Fathers, uh, that is to say, the leaders of the primitive Christian Church up to the Council of Nicaea in approximately 325 A.D., their testimony is important because it carries us back to the early centuries of the Christian era. The evidence provided by the early church fathers contradicts the theory of an Aramaic origin of the Gospels. Actually, the Aramaic theory is a relatively late development, dating probably no earlier than the Middle Ages. Our earliest witness is Papias, the bishop of Heropolis in Asia Minor. That's from the 2nd century A.D. Concerning the origin of the Hebrew Gospels, he states, Matthew put down the words of the Lord in the Hebrew language, and others have translated them, each as best he could. That's from Eusebius' Ecclesiastical History, number 3, 3916. Irenaeus was the bishop of Lyons in France. Most of his literary endeavors were undertaken in the last quarter of the 2nd century A.D. Irenaeus states, <clears throat> Excuse me. Matthew indeed pronounced his gospel written among the Hebrews in their own dialect. That's from Eusebius' Ecclesiastical History, Volume 5. Origen, from the first quarter of the 3rd century, in his commentary on Matthew, states, The first gospel composed in the Hebrew language was written by Matthew for those who came to the faith from Judaism. That's from Eusebius' Ecclesiastical History, Volume 6. Eusebius, the bishop of Caesarea, Around 325 A.D. writes, Matthew had first preached to the Hebrews, and when he was about to go to others also, he transmitted his gospel in writings in his native language. That's from the Ecclesiastical History, Volume 3. There are a few of, these are but a few of the references in the writings of the early church fathers that indicate a Hebrew origin for the gospels. In addition these, to these, there are many references in the later church fathers, that is to say the post-Nicene fathers, from approximately 325 A.D. Epiphanius, for instance, writes at length about the Jewish Christian sect of the Nazarenes. Quote, They have the entire Gospel of Matthew in Hebrew. It is carefully preserved by them as it was originally written <clears throat> in the Hebrew script. Refutation of all heresies, 29. Epiphanius also writes about the Ebionites, another Messianic sect. Quote, they too accept the gospel of Matthew. They call it, quote, according to the Hebrews, unquote, and that is the correct way of speaking since Matthew alone of the New Testament writers <coughs> presents the gospel in Hebrew and in the he Hebrew script, refutation of all heresies. Chapter 30. Jerome was by far the most knowledgeable in Hebrew of all the church fathers. His Latin translation of the Bible, the Vulgate, has remained until today the authoritative Bible for the Roman Catholic Church. Jerome lived the last 31 years of his life in Bethlehem. It was there he produced his Latin translation of the Old Testament, made directly from the Hebrew. Concerning the Gospel of Matthew, Jerome writes, quote, Matthew was the first in Judea to compose the Gospel of Christ in Hebrew letters and words. Who it was that later translated it into the Greek is no longer known for certainty. Furthermore, the Hebrew text itself is still preserved in the library at Caesarea, which the martyr Pamphilius assembled with great care, De Virus in Lustribus, number three. 
Further evidence of the Hebrew origin of the Gospels is mentioned by Lapide. Quote, a recently published Arabic Ptolemaic seems to refute once and for all the views of those scholars who still wish to write off all patristic references to Hebrew as mere mistakes for Aramaic. The manuscript composed in the 10th century is partly based upon the Aramaic document of the 5th century. <clears throat> Of the text which repeatedly dwells on the importance of Hebrew, the language of Jesus and the prophets in which the true gospel has been composed reproaches the Gentile Christians for having abandoned this language, instead of which they took up numerous other languages which had not been spoken by Jesus and his companions. If in spite of the above evidence one should still wish to brush aside the witness of the church fathers as mere tradition, one final fact must be noted. There exists no early church tradition whatsoever for a primitive Aramaic gospel. So there's absolutely no information in the historical record that would suggest that there was an Aramaic gospel first. Now, of course, there are some Aramaic primists out there um, who do push that Aramaic was the first translation because people in... Judea spoke Aramaic. It's the language of Babylon and it came back with the people from the Babylonian captivity. Alright, let's see here. <clears throat> the Dead Sea Scrolls. The Dead Sea Scrolls represent a portion of the library from the Jewish community at Qumran, a small site located in the northwestern shore of the Dead Sea. In 68 AD, two years after the outbreak of the Jewish revolt in Jerusalem, the community met an untimely end when Qumran was attacked and destroyed by the Roman army. The Dead Sea Scrolls are the most dramatic and significant archaeological discovery of all times relating to the biblical text. The finds were brought to light over a 16-year period from 1947 to 1963 when additional scroll finds were made at Masada. They included close to 600 partial manuscripts, both biblical and non-biblical, indicating that there were somewhere around 40,000 fragments, 179 Old Testament manuscripts, many very fragmentary, representing every book except Esther had been found. These finds provide us with the Hebrew manuscripts of the Bible over a thousand years older than any previously known, some only a few hundred years removed from the original autographs. Members of the Dead Sea community, in addition to copying biblical manuscripts, also wrote many original books, such as manuals for new initiates, intended for members of their community. Of the ten major non-biblical scrolls published to date, only one, the Genesis Apocryphon, is in Aramaic. The most recently published scroll and the longest to date, 28 feet, or the equivalent of about 80 Old Testament chapters, is the now famous Temple Scroll, also written in Hebrew. These sectarian scrolls are significant in the discussion of the literary language of the first centuries B.C. and A.D., since they are not simply copies of biblical texts composed hundreds of years earlier, but entirely new writings of Qumran community, which were composed in a period contemporary with Jesus. Scholars have only just begun to study and to appreciate this vast literature. The number of New Testament parallels found in these texts is truly remarkable. The following is an interesting example of such a parallel. Note the similarity. Five sixteen. And that's what technical difficulties look like. When the camera takes a fall. <clears throat> Scholars have just begun to study and to appreciate this vast literature. The number of New Testament parallels found in text is truly remarkable. The following is an interesting example of such a parallel. 
Note the similarity to Galatians 5, 16 through 26. Quote, the God of Israel and his angel of truth have helped us all, the sons of light. It is he who created the spirits of light and darkness, and these are their ways in the world, to enlighten the heart of men, to make straight before him all the ways of true righteousness, to instill in his heart a fear of the judgments of God, a spirit of humility, patience, abundant compassion, eternal goodness, understanding, insight, and mighty wisdom, which is founded on all the works of God and leans on his abundant loving kindness, a spirit of discernment in every purpose, zeal for righteousness, judgments, holy intent with steadfastness of heart, great love for all the sons of truth, virtuous purity which abhors all defilement of idols, modesty of behavior with prudence in all things, and faithfulness in concealing the mysteries of the knowledge. These are the counsels of the spirits to the, son, the spirit to the sons of the truth in this world. And the reward of all who walk in the ways is healing, a long and peaceful life, and a fruitfulness together with every eternal blessing, and an undying joy and life everlasting, a crown of glory and a garment of majesty amid unending light. But to the spirit of perversity belong greed, slackness, and the service of haughtiness, denial, deceit, cruelty, and great hypocrisy, shortness of temper, and profusion of folly, a brazen insolence, abominable deeds, and a spirit of fornication, filthy ways in the service of uncleanness, a blasphemous tongue, the blindness of the eye, and dullness of ear, stiffness of the neck, and hardness of the heart, so that a man walks entirely in the ways of darkness and guile, and a world and the reward of all who walk in its ways is a multitude of afflictions at the hands of all the angels of destruction, eternal damnation through the angry wrath of an avenging God, eternal trembling, everlasting dishonor with the endless disgrace and fire and the darkness and dark places. The times of all their generations will be spent in sorrowful mourning, bitter misfortune, calamities of darkness until they are destroyed without remnant or survival. Manual of Discipline, number three, 24 through 4, 14. So that is a uh, text from the Essenes on creating new disciples. Sounds like these guys in Cotton Mather what I got on well. He's the guy that wrote Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, which is the uh, which is the uh, a famous uh, famous uh, what do you call it? Uh, when a preacher preaches uh, exposit, exposition from a, a, a preacher about how God is holding people like by a little by a little spider thread dangling over hell, and if you do one thing wrong, he'll cut that thread and you'll fall into hell forever. And he's it's, it's called sinners in the hands of an angry God. You can certainly look it up. We had to read it in English class in high school. I remember. If we compare the total number of pages in these ten sectarian scrolls, we again find a nine to one ratio of Hebrew to Aramaic. 179 pages in the nine Hebrew scrolls and 22 pages in the Aramaic in the Genesis Apocryphon. It is even possible that Genesis Apocryphon was not originally written by the Qumran sectarians contemporary with Jesus, but is a Targum originally written a century or two earlier when Aramaic was more popular. Now, a Targum is a, an Aramaic translation of the Holy Text. Uh, they were actually pretty much forbidden for people to have. Um, some rabbis had them, though sometimes when a rabbi had them, it caused him to get uh, a bad reputation. Uh, he writes here, A more probable explanation for the existence of Targums is that, that they performed a useful service for the bilingual and multilingual residents of the land of Israel. The Aramaic translation interpreted, interpreted, interpreted the Hebrew text for religious reasons. The Hebrew original could not be even slightly altered or expanded, but its Aramaic translation could, wherever necessary, comment on or explain hard to understand passages. Which is uh, why you'll see a lot of Aramaic writing uh, when you see rabbis writing about stuff too, because they can't, you can't change the holy text. So instead you have to translate it into a different language. Then you could work and expound upon it and kind of change it to kind of make it make more sense for the way you want to explain it to people. Because remember, all the different rabbis had their own ways of explaining these things. <coughs> uh, 
when they could more easily understand it in Aramaic. It is interesting to note that even before the discovery of the Targum of Job at Qumran, we knew of its existence. We are told in the Talmud in Sabbat 115a that a Targum of Job was once brought to Gamaliel, the teacher of Paul. He ordered it to be built into the walls of the temple, which at that time were still under construction. What this advocates of the Aramaic theory neglects to point out that the Greek translation of scriptures at Qumran outnumber the Targums or Aramaic translations. To date, Greek translations of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers have been discovered at Qumran. If the existence of an Aramaic translation of scripture in the first century could prove the common people spoke Aramaic, then the existence of the Greek translation of scripture could surely prove that some of them spoke Greek, which is absolutely true. I'm sure plenty of them did speak Greek. However, no one argues that Greek was the spoken language However, no one argues that Greek was the spoken language of Israel. So basically saying that, you know, people might argue that Aramaic was being spoken or Hebrew was spoken, but nobody in the Holy Land would be speaking Greek. Number one, because they fought a whole civil war to uh, drive out the Greeks. Number two, it was more a language for people that were in, involved in trade. Because if you're involved in trade, then you're certain to see people from other nations. And if Alexander the Great conquered your nation in the past, your people probably spoke Greek. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. What the advocates of the Aramaic theory neglect to point out is that Greek translations of the scriptures at Qumran, oh, we already read that. Advocates of Aramaic also fail to recognize the significance of the numerous Pesharim commentaries found in Qumran. Pesharim exists on Isaiah, Hosea, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Psalms, and on scattered passages from other books of the Old Testament. All of the Pesharim are written in Hebrew. It is feasible that the commentary on Scripture was written in a language the majority of the people did. Is it feasible that the commentary on Scripture was written in a language the majority of the people did not understand? Question mark. Certainly not. Since the study of Scripture was not in Judaism the prerogative of the priestly caste, as was mentioned earlier, pages 42 and 43, Professor Frank Cross has concluded that Hebrew had replaced Aramaic and was the commonly used language in Palestine in 130 B.C. An interesting question is, why? Like Hebrew, Aramaic belongs to the Semitic family of languages. Many words are common in both languages. Still, other words have the same root. Aramaic was the official language of Persia as well as the lingua franca of Assyria and Babylon from 700 to 300 B.C. The influence of Aramaic upon the kingdoms of Judah and Samaria was considerable. Although its influence in the northern kingdom was greater than in Judah, the northern kingdom of Samaria was conquered by the Assyrians in 134, or 134 years before the defeat of Judah. So that's to say the Assyrian invasion that lost the ten tribes happened 134 years before Babylon invaded. When a large part of the population of the southern kingdom of Judah was carried away into Babylon in captivity in 587 BC, numerous changes took place. Aramaic was adopted by most of the Jews in captivity. When the Jews were allowed to return in 538 BC, they had become so accustomed to life in Babylon that only 40,000 returned to Jerusalem. Most of these returning used Aramaic as their principal language, while the Jews who had been in exile and who had remained in Judah still spoke Hebrew. The inhabitants of Judah soon developed a multilingual culture and probably used Hebrew and Aramaic locally. In 19, sorry, he says almost equally. In 167 BC, the temple was desecrated by Antiochus IV Epiphanes, an Assyrian Seleucid ruler over Palestine. Shortly thereafter, the Jews, led by Judah and Maccabee, revolted against the tyranny and the harsh policies of Antiochus. There seems little doubt that this revolt, which accumulated in the cleansing of the temple in December of 164 B.C., spurred a religious revival among the Jews. It was the Maccabean victory which gradually led to the reinstatement of an ancestral language, Hebrew as the dominant language in the whole of Palestine. Similarly, in recent times it was Hebrew that won the struggle over which language would be the national language of Jews once again living in their homeland state of Israel later to become the modern-day state of Israel. So, <clears throat> now, this is conjecture, which is he's saying basically that um, most likely after that civil war was fought and the Greeks were defeated, that Hebrew would have been the Libra, lingua franca, which means, the, frankly, the language that people use. It means what most people speak. Uh, because there was probably a religious and um, a, a revival, because... Secular Jews 
a lot of them sided with Hellenism or they were willing to become Greek and do what you know Antiochus wanted. They'd have a problem with it. But Jews who want to be religious, Jews who are in the priesthood, um, Jews who just wanted to obey what the Torah said, they fought against those ideas of Antiochus and the Greeks. And eventually they won out. Now, that's not, you know, I'm not talking about a, uh, we dropped a nuke on them and took them out victory. I mean, it was basically the Greeks backed off and said, all right, you can run your own government, but you're still going to pay. You're still going to send us money and resources and stuff. Lots of times, um, kings and governments and such will just let go of a vassal state that's too much trouble and just make a, a trade deal with them or put a friend, as you might call it, in charge. Like, that's where the term friend of Caesar comes from. Remember when Christ was being crucified, the Jews said, are you a friend of Caesar? And Because uh, a friend of Caesar is someone who works on Caesar's behalf, even though he isn't necessarily um, you know, on his direct payroll, so to speak. And usually a friend of Caesar is somebody who gets appointed, like Herod was appointed by Augustus Caesar as the friend of Caesar in Judea. Coins and inscriptions. The evidence provided by coins is also important in trying to evaluate the linguistic situation in the time of Jesus. Yaakov Moshir, curator of the numismatic department of the Israel Museum, is a numismatic expert and has listed 215 Jewish coins in his catalog. Of these, 99 have Hebrew inscriptions. Only one has an Aramaic inscription. From the 4th century BC, and that's the late Persian period, until the end of the Bar Kokhba revolt, and here shows pictures of the different, different coins and the different time periods that they're from, revolt in 135 AD, the entire history of Jewish coinage, only one Jewish coin minted during the reign of Alexander Yanaeus from 103 to 76 BC is inscribed in Aramaic. In addition, To the evidence from these coins, there is considerable epi epigraphal evidence from inscriptions. The archaeological excavations at the Temple Mount, directed by Professor Benjamin Nazir of the Hebrew University, are the most extensive ever undertaken in Israel. Since the beginning of these excavations in 1968, numerous inscriptions have been unearthed. It is significant that no Aramaic inscriptions from the Roman period have yet been found. All the inscriptions that have been found are either in Hebrew, Greek, or Latin. Two of these inscriptions are worthy of note. The first is the inscription on a large stone, part of the uppermost course of stones at the southwest corner of the Temple Mount. During the destruction of the Temple in 70 AD by Titus and the Roman army, this stone was pushed off from a height of approximately 115 feet to the Herodian pavement below. <clears throat> there, Israeli archaeologists discovered it some 1900 years later. The stone was broken in the fall, and only a portion of the inscription remained, and it read, Levet Hatikeva, the place of the trumpeting. This was the spot where the shofar, or ram's horn trumpet, was blown to announce the beginning or the end of the Shabbat. <coughs> See Josephus' Wars of the Jews, number four. The second inscription contains only one Hebrew word, Korban, a word mentioned by Jesus in Mark 7.11, which reads, But if you say, if a man to, says to his mother or father, Whatever help you might have received from me is Korban, that is a gift, then he is no longer required to do anything for his mother and father. <coughs> the word Korban is archaeologically documented for the first time in a non-literary context in this inscription. At Masada, Herod's stronghold overlooking the Dead Sea, Archaeologists excavated 1963 to 1965 under the direction of Professor Yigiel Yidin. The epigraphical evidence is staggering. Fragments of 14 scrolls, over 4,000 4, coins, and more than 700 ostraca. Those are inscribed pottery fragments. In Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek, and Latin. Here, too, the ratio of Hebrew to, and it shows the pictures of where they found them and some of the stuff that was found. More examples of where they dug and the kind of stuff they found. Pictures of crucifixions. It's a picture of a crucifixion based on the skeletal remains that have been found. Um, metal driven through wood. 
where a man's heel bone was actually found in the wood. I've seen that before. Uh, and there's an ossuary. That is a bone box where they put bones. It's got Hebrew uh, written on it. It's actually block Hebrew too. And Aramaic is again 9 to 1. So for the documents they actually found, 9 out of 10 of them were written in Hebrew. One of them was written in Aramaic. Further epigraphical evidence can be found on ossuaries, that is to say stone burial chambers, in the Jewish burial style of this period. The bones of the deceased were collected exactly one year after death and reinterred in a small container carved from stone. These boxes were generally decorated with geometric and other designs and often inscribed with the name of the deceased. Sometimes the bones of a man and his wife were collected and put in the same ossuary. No. These inscriptions were usually scratched on the ossuary by a family member or friend rather than a skilled craftsman. Thus, there is an important indication of the spoken and written language of the common people, as Milik put, pointed out. So these bone boxes, which you can see has got stuff, somebody scratched it on there with whatever implement they had, they could scratch in that stone. It wasn't some, they didn't pay somebody a special fee and say, oh, you, Rabbi, please write a beautiful Hebrew inscription. No, it's people knew how to write it so they they did it themselves these inscriptions were usually scratched on the ossuary by a family member or friend the presence of hebrew besides greek and aramaic on ossuaries which represents the use of the middle classes surely attests that this was a natural language and that the milu and not merely a religious use of the classical holy tongue for instance the beth page lid the pay list of an undertaker's employees in hebrew is written according to Melech 1963. So on Josephus. Josephus was a Jewish historian of the first century AD and in 66 AD at the beginning of the great revolt against Rome he was the commander of the Jewish forces in Galilee. Realizing that all was lost he defected to the Romans and became their official historian. His writings provide us with a great deal of reliable information on Jewish culture and the events of the first century BC and AD. In his writings, Josephus often refers to the Jewish language as Hebrew when dealing with the history of the first century. It appears obvious from these references that Hebrew was the spoken and written language of the first century. However, the same scholars who contend that the New Testament references to Hebrew mean that it means actually Aramaic have also contended that when Joseph refers to Hebrew, he actually means Aramaic. Grint strongly disagrees with this saying. An investigation of the writings of Josephus demonstrates beyond doubt that whenever Josephus mentions Glata Ibrien, or Hebrew tongue, he always means Hebrew, and no other language. Grint supports this statement with his many excellent examples from Josephus. Only two will be quoted here. The first is from Josephus' Antiquities of the Jews, quote, For which reason we also pass this day in repose from toil and call it the Sabbath, or Sabbata, a word which in the Hebrew language, Ibrian dialecton, means rest. So he explains to the Greeks that that word actually, that word means rest. Grinst concludes, Josephus describes, as had the Bible, the word Sabbat from the Hebrew SHBT, Shabbat. In Aramaic, the verb Shabbat does not exist. Aramaic translators use instead NCH transcriptions by authors a second example so in other words he's saying that the way Josephus phrased it when he explained what it meant he used it as a um, a verb he's saying so on the Sabbath we Shabbat that's what we do we Shabbat on the Sabbath which is not a phrase in Arabic or sorry Aramaic in Aramaic you would say in ch uh, which I guess is noon kof hey don't know how to pronounce it but in Aramaic that would be how you use that as a verb because you uh, he used that statement as a verb statement a second example found in the antiquities of the Jews now this man is called Adam which he in the Hebrew glata ebrion signifies red thus Josephus derives Adam as in a man from Adam which is red in Aramaic red is expressed by sumka there is no root Adam in this language. So in other words, he uses the term, he says Adam, the man Adam, so-called because of his red, he was red like the ground. So in Aramaic, if you, if you said red, the word would be sumka, 
which is not anything like Adam. Josephus does not does refer to Aramaic words, but what should be emphasized is Josephus never said of any of these words cited in their Aramaic form that they were Hebrew in the rabbinic literature of the time. So we're going through all the different um, evidences to support this. We've seen archaeological finds. We've seen the writings of Josephus. Um, all this stuff in the 1980s, this was new. This stuff is all 30, 40 years old now. Um, but we're still just learning about it. Still just learning. Rabbinical literature. The largest and most significant body of the written material from the time of Jesus is known as the rabbinical literature. Except for isolated words or sentences, it is written entirely in Hebrew. The best known of this literature is the Mishnah. The Mishnah, or oral law, it actually means the repeatings, was transmitted orally until it was finally committed to writing about 200 A.D. by Rabbi Yehuda Hanasi, that's, Ju that's Judah the Prince. Today's standard Hebrew edition by Hanat Albek is printed in six volumes. It contains rabbinic rulings, customs, traditions, pithy sayings, and homiolytical material. The Mishnah is only one of six works of similar length known collectively as the early rabbinic literature. They are all written in Hebrew. So all those religious writings, all written in Hebrew. It may come as a surprise to some, but most of the difficult passages or problems confronted in the New Testament studies could be solved through the knowledge of the rabbinic literature. Many of Jesus' sayings have their parallels in the rabbinic literature. Do his will as if it were your will, that he may do your will as if it were his will. That's a rabbinic saying. Compare that to Matthew 6.10 and 7.21. Conform your will to his will, that he may conform the will of others to your will. That's from Avolf 2.6. Compare that to 1 Peter 5.6. Note the similarity between the golden rule of Matthew 7.12 and the following writing of Rabbi Eliezer, who said, Let the honor of your fellow man be as dear to you as your own. So you should honor other people even above yourself. Similar are the sayings of Rabbi Yose. Let the possessions, or that is to say the mammon, of your fellow man be as dear to you as your own. So you need to guard his possessions just as well as you would guard your own. The sayings of Rabbi Tarfon reminds us of Jesus saying in Luke 10, 2. And he parallels also to 9, 37 of Matthew. The day is short and the task is great and the laborers are lazy. But the wages are high, and the master of the house is urgent. A Volf 2.15 Many rabbinic sayings have no direct parallel in the New Testament, but sound so similar that one might think that they were from the New Testament. I thought the same thing about the book of Enoch, by the way. Rabbi Jacob said, The world is like an entry hall, preceding the world to come. Prepare yourself in the entry hall that you may enter into the banqueting hall. Sounds like the father saying bring all those people outside from the street in any love that depends on some passing thing when the thing disappears the love vanishes too but a love that does not depend on some passing thing will last forever which love was it that depended on some passing thing that was the love of Amnon and Tamar from 2 Samuel 13 and which love is that that did not depend on some set on some passing thing uh, that was the love of David and Jonathan from 2 Samuel and that's according to Avoth 5.16. Judah the son of Tema said, Be as strong as a leopard and as swift as an eagle, as fleet as a gazelle and as brave as a lion, to do the will of the Father in heaven. Now from the Midrash. The Midrash, or rabbinical commentary on scripture, um, even Midrash writings hundreds of years after the time of Jesus, is still entirely in Hebrew and is only occasionally intercepted with Aramaic words, phrases, or sentences. The following is an example of a homeolytic literature and material from the Midrash. Quote, As long as Moses held up his hands, Israel prevailed. But whenever he lowered his hands, Amalek prevailed. Exodus 17.11 But could the hands of Moses really change the outcome of the battle for better or for worse? Is it rather to teach you that as long as the Israelites directed their thoughts on the high and kept their hearts in subjection to the Father in heaven, they prevailed. Otherwise, they suffered defeat. You could say the same about the verse, quote, make yourself a fiery serpent and mount it upon a standard. And if anyone who is bitten looks at it, he will recover. 
Numbers 21.8. But could the serpent kill or could the serpent heal? It is rather to teach you that as long as the Israelites directed their thoughts on high and kept their hearts in subjection to the Father in heaven, they were healed. Otherwise, they would be wasted away from Rosh Hashanah 3, eight. So it's basically this is Haggadah from different rabbis. An explanation of why things, or another way of looking at why things were done. Like for instance, like he says, Moses was told by God to put a snake up on a pole. Raise that snake on a pole and people be healed. And they're like, well, obviously that snake can't heal anybody. It can't hurt anybody. Only Yehovah can make people better or kill and heal and make alive. So the point is that we should put our eyes to where he says put our eyes to. And then we will receive the healing. If we'll keep our eyes where we're supposed to keep them. And of course, later in the New Testament, we see him says, now, just as the snake was raised up on the pole, Yeshua says, so the Son of Man must be raised up. And when he is, all will be drawn to him. Jewish prayers. The Jewish prayers, some of which date from the time of Jesus and before, are also all, all entirely in Hebrew. The following prayers are strongly reminiscent of the Lord's Prayer. Quote, May your will be done in heaven above, and grant peace and contentment to those who fear you, and do whatever seems best to you. Tosafat Barakoch 3.7 May it be your will, O Lord my God, to make me familiar with your law, and cause me to adhere to your commandments. Do not lead me into sin, nor into iniquity, nor into temptation, nor into dishonor. Compel my impulses to serve you, and keep me far from the evil man and, or, or and evil companions. Give me good desires and good companions, and this is my life. And let me this day and every day find grace, favor, and mercy in your eyes and in the eyes of all, who, all those who see me. And grant me your best blessings. Bless you, O Lord, who grants your blessings to your people, Israel. Berachah 60b. So the prayers that have been taught by the Pharisees down from all the ages, all in Hebrew. Rabbinic parables. In the Gospels we see that one of Jesus' favorite methods of teaching is a parable. Rabbinic literature contains about 5,000 parables. Only two are known in Aramaic. The following is an example of, an Arama of a rabbinic parable. He whose wisdom is greater than his works, what is he like? A tree whose branches are many, but whose roots are few. And the wind comes and uproots and overturns it. But he whose, he whose works are greater than his wisdom, what is he like? A tree whose branches are few, but whose roots are many. Even if all the winds were to come against it, they could not move it. That is a Vulf 3.18. This is a close parallel to Matthew 7.24. The special type of parable is what is called the king parable. Form often used by Jesus. The rabbinic king parables were collected by I. Ziegler and published in the Breslev 1903. Ziegler listed some 850 king parables. Here is an example preceded by typical dialogue between the rabbi and his disciples. Quote, Rabbi Eliezer said, Repent one day before your death. His disciples asked him, but can a man know on what day he will die? He said, So much the more must he repent today. Perhaps he will die tomorrow. It follows that a man should repent every day. Thus, in the wisdom Solomon had said, quote, Let your garments always be white, and let not the oil be lacking on your head. Rabbi Yochanan, the son of Zakai, told a parable, quote, It is like a king who invited his servants to a feast and did not set a time for them to arrive. The wise adorned themselves and waited by the door of the palace, for they said, Is there anything lacking in a palace? The foolish continued working, for they said, Is a feast ever given without preparation? Suddenly the king summoned his servants. The wise entered the palace adorned as they were, but the foolish entered in their working clothes. The king rejoiced when he saw the wise, but he was angry when he saw, saw the foolish and said, Those who adorn themselves for the feast shall sit down and eat and drink, but those who did not adorn themselves for the feast shall stand and look on. That's from Shabbat 153a. Note the striking similarity between the above parable and the parable of the ten virgins from Matthew 10. Here's another example of a king parable from the rabbinic literature followed by its interpretation. <coughs> <coughs> the matter may be compared to a king who arranged a banquet and invited guests to it. The king issued a decree which stated, quote, Each guest must bring something on which to recline. Some brought carpets, others brought mattresses or pads or cushions or stools, while still others brought logs or stones. 
The king observed what they had done and said, Let each man sit down on the thing he has brought. Those who had to sit on wood or stone murmured against the king, and they said, It is respectful for the king that we, his guests, should be seated on wood or stone? Question mark. When the king heard this, he said to them, It is not enough that you have disgraced with your wood and stone the palace that was erected by me at great cost, but you dare to invent a complaint against me? The lack of respect paid to you is the result of your own actions. Similarly, hereafter, the wicked will be sentenced to Gehenam, that's the Valley of Hinnom, by the way, this is Gehenna in, in Greek, and will be mur murmur against the Holy One, blessed be he, saying, quote, We sought his salvation. How could, he, how could such a fate befall us? He will answer them. When you were on the earth, did you not quarrel and slander and do evil? Were you not responsible for strife and violence? That is why it is written, quote, All you that are kindling a fire, that encircles yourselves with firebrands. Walk in the flames of the fire among the brands that you have kindled. Isaiah 50.11 If you say, quote, This we have from our own hand. It is not so. You have brought it on yourselves, and therefore you will lie down in torment. From Ecclesiastes Rabbah 3.9 Note the similarities between this parable and the parable of the banquet in Matthew 22. Also Luke 14. Also Matthew 7. Rabbinic parables give us a clear indication of the language in which Jesus taught. Jesus was thoroughly versed in the written and oral law. As we noted above, he followed rabbinic custom and taught in parables. He often used the king's parables, like the other rabbis of the first century. He would certainly have communicated his parables in Hebrew. There is also textual evidence to prove that Jesus delivered his parables in Hebrew. Note how the Hebraic they are, as illustrated by the parable of the prodigal son. And his father saw him, and had compassion on him, and ran, and fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the father said to his servants, Bring quickly the best robe, and put it on him, and put, literally give a Hebrew idiom, a ring on his hand, and sandals on his feet, and bring the fatty calf, and kill it, and let us eat, and make merry. This passage is an excellent example of one of the characteristic features of Hebrew syntax. Greek, like other European languages, does not have this kind of sentence structure with the conjunction and appearing over and over again. Greek prefers to subordinate an independent clause to the main clause of the sentence. For example, when I woke up, I got dressed. That's a complete sentence. As soon as I ate breakfast, I brushed my teeth. Another complete sentence. After I read the morning newspaper, I drove to work. Again, a complete sentence. Hebrew, on the other hand, prefers to join clauses with a conjunction, like and. To the European, this continual use of and is distracting and sometimes irritating. In Hebrew, as the above, I, if you read the above in a Hebrew way, it would say, and I woke up, and I got dressed, and I ate breakfast, and I brushed my teeth, and I read the morning paper, and I drove to work. We often see the same syntax in the Old Testament. The author's very literal translation of a brief passage below will serve as an example. Quote, and the earth was without form and empty, and darkness was on the face of the earth, and the Spirit of God moved on the face of the earth, and the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God said, Light, and that it was good. And God divided between the light and the darkness. And God called light day, and he called darkness night, and there was evening, and there was morning. That's a direct word-for-word -word translation of the text. This, as well as other grammatic features in the Gospels, is actually independent confirmation that the life story of Jesus was originally written in Hebrew. Why is it, when we see features like the excessive use of the conjunction and in the Gospels, we do not recognize the Gospels are derived from a Hebrew source? The English speaker has grown so accustomed to this style through the reading overly literal translations of the Old Testament that when it occurs in the New Testament, he fails to recognize it as a Hebrew style. He should immediately recognize it for what it is, obvious proof that the Gospels have derived from a Hebrew origin. That's the end of chapter 5. So what he's saying basically is he's given us plenty of different sources. He says, look, just look at the way it's written with a whole bunch of ands at the end of every state, conjoining every statement together. Uh, rabbinic parables of the time were all said in Hebrew. All the rabbis said their parables in Hebrew. All the Jewish prayers taught by the rabbis, rabbis at the time were all in Hebrew. The Midrash, all in Hebrew. The rabbinic literature of the time, all in Hebrew. The writings of Josephus, even the way he talked about Hebrew, he said it was Hebrew, but people have said, no, no, he means Aramaic. Uh, but he even says, um, 
he says word phrases that only make sense in Hebrew that don't make sense in Aramaic. Um, again, archaeological finds, ossuaries, handwritten messages on them, written in Hebrew by people who were common at the time. I mean, the, the cross of Yeshua had the Greek, Latin, the Hebrew on it. It was written in the languages of that would have meant something to the people at time at the time. Uh, and Hebrew definitely would have meant something to the Hebrew people. That's kind of the point. Um, let's see what else he's got. Pottery fragments. Hebrew writing all over them. Uh, stones from the temple that un unearthed. Hebrew writing all over them. Coins minted by the Maccabees. All with Hebrew inscriptions. Only one of them had an Aramaic inscription on it. Uh, scrolls from the Qumran text. All written in Hebrew. Not Well, nine out of ten written in Hebrew. One would be written in Aramaic. And that was just the uh, Genesis, Genesis, Genesis Apocryphon, which I don't even know what that is. But needless to say, there were plenty of interesting <clears throat> works of the time, plenty of reasons to think that Yeshua spoke Hebrew, Yeshua taught in Hebrew, and his apostles and his disciples wrote the religious writings concerning him in the Hebrew language. We start that chapter off with four church fathers who confirm it straight out of their mouths, if nothing else, if nothing else, that Matthew was without a doubt the first one written, and it was written in Hebrew. Those church fathers are, let's see, all of them from the same book. It's, it's Eusebius' it's Ecclesiastical History, but it's Papias, Iranius, uh, Eusebius confirms it, uh, Jerome confirms it, uh, let's see, Epiphanius, uh, spent a lot of time writing about the uh, the Nazarenes who lived uh, north of uh, they probably I think they lived around Antioch, but they lived north of uh, Israel, and they had a functioning Jewish community that considered Yeshua the Messiah, and they had all their texts in Hebrew. Their New Testament texts were Hebrew texts. Their Matthew was Hebrew, absolutely, and they read it in Hebrew and studied it in Hebrew, and that's the way they learned it. And those were people who literally were the bloodline descendants from the uh, original disciples. You know, not, not the church, but people who came right from those disciples and had basically kind of started living communally, had their own, uh, I guess, kibbutz or whatever you call it, where they shared and took care of each other. A, a commune, so to speak. Um, which, whether we like it or not, is kind of what's coming for people who want to be in the priesthood because you really can't own property if you're in the priesthood. You really can't worry about working a real, quote-unquote, real job. Because your inheritance, of course, is God, and then he will provide for you. And So when you get money, it's just really for everybody to use for the purpose of furthering you know, the, the priestly duty. So with that, very interesting. Uh, he hits us with a bunch of different, uh, bunch of different points. It would be nice to have something in the science world is that you want to always try to disprove your theory. You don't want to try to prove it. You want to try to disprove it. Do whatever you got to do to disprove it. So if... Hopefully, as we read further along, he will supply us with why people would think that Greek was the prim, primer text, or even why Aramaic is. And uh, so, Baruch Hashem, Yehovah, he is the uh, the Blessed One, the Holy One of Israel. May he walk with you throughout your days and uh, conform you to the likeness of his Son, so that you can be um, an upstanding man who can walk upright before the Father and uh, take up your place on that cross and uh, deny yourself daily so that you can be known as a son of the, the Most High. Amen.